as we uh, need to stay with the time. As I've said before, can everybody please make sure they're on mute and switch their cameras off, please? Uh, there's still a few people that have their cameras on that aren't presenting. Uh, if you can switch those off because it does use the bandwidth and it is a distraction as well. So um, today we've got a, a presentation by uh, Scott Stone about horizontal directional drilling. Uh, this event today is being put together by the Pipeline Industry Guild Outfalls Intakes and Landfalls Technical Panel. For those of you who are not aware, we, uh, we're a panel that is made up of uh, the industry experts with expertise in the manufacture, operation, maintenance, design, construction, commissioning, decommissioning, health and safety, security and environmental aspects of outfalls, intakes and landfalls. Um, we've been active in the panel in the guild for about three years now. Um, we meet every quarter. Um, uh, so if you want to find out any more information about what the panel does, please have a look on the Guild website and there's contact details in there as well. Um, so today's presentation is being uh, given by Scott, uh, Scott Stone. He is the Technical Operations Manager of Volca Trenchless Solutions. He's also the Vice Chair Technical and Education Subcommittee. He's a board member of the Drilling Contractors Association and he is a panel member of the Intakes Outfalls and Landfalls panel. Um, so very pleased that uh, Scott has uh, uh, agreed to do this presentation and I hope it will be very informative and give you an overview of drill horizontal drilling and various other techniques, etc. So I will hand over to you, Scott. You're muted still, Scott. Hold on. You're muted, Scott. You're still muted, Scott. I don't know how. Can you? Uh... Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's it. Sorted. OK. All right. OK. Um, well, one second, let's just get this on. Right, hello everybody. Um, uh, as Martin said, my name is Scott Stone. Um, I've been actively involved in the HDD industry now for, for about 33 years. Um, uh, basically, when the uh, technique came over from the States, our company was the first to, to adopt this. So throughout the years, of the 30 odd years, I've, I've worked my way doing most operations on the drilling rig. Um, either operationally or as project management. Are you um, sharing your screen, Scott? You just double check. Should, should be. Um, one second. We can see the slide that's got the presenter with your picture on it. You can see it, can you? Yes. So you, I am sharing it. OK, yeah. that's fine. Yep. Yeah. OK, so um, yes, so I've been involved in the HDD industry large scale for around about 30 odd years now, um, working with the Volker Group. And uh, at the moment, I head up the, uh, the technical side uh, for the entire Volker Group uh, in the UK and in Europe. Um, just to give you an idea, a little bit of background about our company. Um, about three years ago, we set up a, a joint venture with our specialist HCD drilling division in, in Holland, which is Visser and Smith Hanab. So when we're working in the UK, we are known as Volker Trenchless Solutions. Uh, basically, we are a, a construction company, uh, core sectors are rail, highways, energy, water, defence, airports, and obviously specialist division of horizontal directional drilling. Um, the areas of expertise that we have within our company is uh, horizontal directional drilling, um, engineering, and also we have specialist technologies, which is where we have adapted the HDD technique to uh, develop new ways of working. Um, and we'll go on to the engineering side in a little bit uh, in a little bit further detail. So in 1984, we were the first company in Europe to uh, bring over this new 
technique of working, which was developed in the USA. Um, we have a wide range of drilling rigs. Uh, drilling rigs are always um, classed on their pulling capacity. So we have drilling rigs ranging from 27 up to 450 tonnes. Um, and nowadays, those uh, larger rigs can install pipelines of diameters up to 56 inches. And we are able to drill, uh, due to the changing techniques, over in excess of three kilometres. So it really has moved on in the last recent years. And we, we're getting uh, more possibilities where this technique can be utilised. Um, just generally regarding our engineers that we have, uh, we have approximately 40 engineers who are specialists in engineering solutions with respect to HDD. Um, when we look at a HDD project, there are a number of uh, elements that we need to cover to make sure the, the suitability um, of the, uh, the product or the pipeline that we're installing. So we have to do uh, pulling force calculations, making sure that the, the duct is not overly stressed during the installation. Um, if, for example, they are plastic PE ducts, we have to make sure that there is uh, no risk of uh, collapse or implosion. Um, we have to also uh, do a dead man uh, temporary anchoring design for the drilling rig so that it will be able to withstand the anticipated pulling forces that are likely to be encountered during the installation process. Um, mud pressure calculations, this is where we, we calculate the actual uh, drilling fluid uh, calculations of the mud force, of the, sorry, of the mud pressures to see and make sure and try and go and drill in a particular level or strata which will um, encourage the drilling fluid to flow back along the bore and not up to surface. Um, all of our own uh, drilling crews um, are all uh, employed. Uh, they're all allocated to one particular drilling rig and they stay with that, that equipment. Um, and with regards to um, standards, we work to the latest B, uh, British standards or European standards which are applicable for the HDD process. Sorry, Scott. Sorry, Scott. Can I just have, there's a few of us who aren't seeing the presentation. I don't know whether um, it's possible to just stop sharing and share again. Okay, one sec. Let me, I, don't, um, I don't know. I think some are seeing it and some aren't. I, we're, I'm we're not really, seeing it. We're only seeing the first slide with your picture on it. That's all. Yeah. Oh, you've not seen any slides move on. Okay, then let me... I, I would completely stop sharing and start yeah, again. One second. And can everybody else please make sure they're muted, please? And uh, the video cameras are off. <laughs> Okay, we can see your PowerPoint. We can't. Uh, Second. Uh, can you yes. see that now? Okay, just scroll down a couple of slides just to make sure. Yes, it's moving. Go for it. Right. Just carry on from sort of where you were. Okay, so so basically this was the, the company highlights um, of where we sit within the Volker Group, Volker Transfer Solutions in the UK, uh, uh, basically to do Volker Wessels UK under um, Volker Steven and also Visser and Smith. Um, as I explained, we have um, we specialise in horizontal directional drilling. Um, we have our own engineering division, and we've also developed new technologies uh, which work in harmony in combination with HDD. Um, again, we started in '84, uh, one of the first companies in Europe to adopt this method of working, 
and we have varying rig sizes from 27 to 450 tonne. And this is their pullback capacity. It's not their weight, it's how much uh, force that they are able to apply during the installation. And again, we have seen um, up to now that basically pipelines using this method can now be installed up to 56 inches in diameter. And with some uh, advancements in the tracking systems that we are able to exceed drilling lengths of in excess of, of three kilometers. Um, so uh, the engineers uh, and our back office, basically we have to do uh, certain calculations to confirm the suitability of the uh, process and particularly the pipe we want to install. So we calculate uh, anticipated pulling forces. Um, also what is very important is buoyancy calculations because when we install pipelines, we want them to be sort of floating in the drilled bore and not, uh, not sinking or not uh, duly, um, excessively buoyant that they push to the roof of the bore. Um, we also carry out temporary works calculations for things like dead man anchoring of the drilling rig based on the anticipated pulling forces. Um, and we also carry out mud pressure calculations and determine which is the best strata to drill through to ensure that the drilling fluid flows back along the bore and not up through the formation and out to surface. Um, as I've said, all our drilling crews are self, uh, uh, fully employed by ourselves and they're all allocated their own equipment. And we're always working to the latest BS or European standards. So the, the HDD process, uh, what is it used for? So typical applications are, um, when you need to either cross a road or a railway or a river, something that is very uh, either difficult to, to open cut or will cause a uh, substantial uh, disruption, this is when uh, HDD is used. Um, it's also used in environmentally sensitive areas. So if there are any issues that open cut would uh, present, um, it can be used for those sort of areas. And also, uh, like we've said, that it's used for long sea outfalls, shore approaches. So this could be for a, uh, a wind farm. It could be a discharge tunnel. Um, so it can be going either way to get something on shore or to discharge something away from the shoreline. Um, it can be for any real medium. Um, it can be for a gas pipeline, water, electricity cables, fiber optics, um, as a conduit um, for uh, another fiber cable. So there are lots of applications where we can um, use this technique. Um, our own equipment is all, um, is all basically uh, stored in Holland in our yard. Um, there we have uh, unlimited uh, resources with regards to um, fabrication workshops, welding, um, electrical and paint uh, facilities. And obviously we have uh, extensive use of our catalog of, of plant and equipment. So even the, uh, a lot of our drilling tools and reaming assemblies, uh, we actually manufacture ourselves. Um, so with regards to um, the HDD process, um, there have been numerous developments over the uh, recent years. And one of them um, is regarding intersect drillings. Uh, whereas previously we have been restricted on the, the drilling lengths that we can actually achieve, um, now with the advancement and, and developments in the steering systems, we're physically able to drill from both sides of the, um, where we want to drill from and to. We can drill from either side with two independent drilling machines, and we can actually drill from one bore into the other bore. Um, this uh, means that basically the pushing forces required uh, are limited because you're only drilling halfway, but you are able to then drill slowly into the other pre-drilled bore 
and then advance one right the way through. Um, an example of this um, was a project that we, we executed in Rotterdam uh, approximately four or five years ago now. Um, the drilling was uh, 1500 meters long. Um, it was in the, the heart of Rotterdam and we, we drilled down to uh, a depth of approximately 60 meters. And we also had to make a side bend or a horizontal curve of approximately 60 de degrees. So to achieve this in one, uh, one shot for, with one drilling machine would have been very challenging because by the time you get to a thousand meters and you've turned 60 degrees, basically your, your pushing force required to get that initial pilot bore out um, would be very limited um, because you would use up all your pushing force uh, on the actual bend and wouldn't be transferred to the drilling bit. So what we did was, on this case, we, we drilled basically a thousand meters from one side with a larger 450 ton rig. And then we drilled uh, 500 meters from the opposite side, from the ex so-called exit point back and intersected with that bore. Once we had done that, then that freed off the friction and we physically pushed the, the 450 tons drill head through whilst retracting the drilling head that we had drilled the 500 meters with the 100 ton rig. So that gives you a, um, a bit of an idea as to, to what can be possible um, with regards to intersect drillings. Um, just talking a little bit more about the, the possibilities with HDD now, um, due to the uh, increasing uh, uh, quality of the steering systems, we're also able to do uh, considerably large side bends. 60 degrees is possible. We can almost go to 90 degrees. So even if you have a entry point and an exit point, which aren't aligned um, in a straight line, there are still possibilities to use this technique to drill from one point to another. Um, slant drilling um, is something which we um, had to develop. Uh, to a certain extent, um, we, we did so. We actually executed uh, two projects in Norway. Uh, the first one was around about 15 years ago, and the more recent one was about three years ago. Um, and this was where we had to um, adapt the the standard drilling rig uh, to drill at a, an, an angle of approximately 45 degrees. Um, the reason for this was because we were drilling um, on a refinery and we were relatively close to the, the water's edge on the fjord and the drilling had to um, exit the bottom of the fjord some 250, 300 metres below seabed level. So going in um, on the conventional entry angle between um, sort of 8 and 15 degrees we would never have achieved and reached the actual exit position. So this is why we had to make a, a new design to elevate the rig to the 45 degrees. Um, we did this in combination with the manufacturer because obviously everything is orientated, not as, as planned or designed. Um, so this gives you some ideas of, of what the possibilities are. Um, because we were drilling on 45 degrees, um, initially, we drilled the, the pilot hold bore. Um, that was relatively conventional. And once completed uh, the pilot bore, we did have to um, enlarge the bore uh, to facilitate the installation of the pipeline. Um, we did this by forward reaming. So once we finished the pilot and punched out on the seabed, um, we retracted everything back to the onshore position. And from here, then we started forward reaming um, with uh, with a hole opener because the the uh, ground conditions we encountered there was granite, which was approximately 175 um, MPA. Now, under normal circumstances, if we were using drilling fluid um, and and go advancing the drill head in a um, rock formation, the progress is relatively slow. So what you can see here on this picture is we had a, a casing pipe. We had a flange section on the front, which was closed. 
and we actually pumped um, high volumes of seawater to actually flush the chip-ins and the, the cuttings from the bore as we made it out into the bottom of the fjord. Um, and we ended up pumping, I think on this one, we pumped around about 3,600 uh, cubic meters of water per hour. So we were pumping huge volumes to keep these cuttings um, in suspension and flow them out of the bottom of the bore. Um, something else which we have developed, um, which is known as arc drilling. So if, if you imagine a, a conventional HDD going into the ground on around about 10 or 12 degrees and coming out the other end on 10 or 12 degrees, if you want to install a uh, 1200 millimeter steel pipeline, when you consider uh, that pipeline uh, radius um, under normal circumstances would also be around about 1200 meter radius and you wanted to go say 10 meters deep below the, the surface, we would soon come to realize that the, the actual drilling, overall drilling length would be in the region of 500 meters. Um, and what we have developed is a, a technique of working, which is known as arc drilling. So what we would do is we would actually uh, pre-drill uh, a pilot bore and uh, with a radius of around about um, 250 meters, we would go under the obstacle. And then what we would do is we would pre-bend three sections of the 48 inch pipeline and we would pre-bend it into a radius of um, 250 meters. So it was like a so-called banana shape. Once that's done, you can see here, this pipeline is, is strung up in the air. And then what we would do is we would pull it back in three sections so that it is already pre-stressed and pre-bent into the given radius that we drilled the bore. Um, this shows it a little bit better. Um, so you can see that section uh, is already there. Um, so there would have been two sections laying down behind this already pre-bent. So we would install approximately 60 meters. We would then stop, weld the next section, pull it into the next section of the ball and so forth with about the third. Um, and, and that would be done in about three pieces and again, typical installation time for that would be um, around about a day and a half. So this so-called 500 meter drilling has then been reduced to approximately 170 meters. So this is a way that the technology can be used to actually um, install large diameter pipes under relatively short uh, horizontal distances. Um, now, some of you may or, or may not know that um, one thing which um, the HDD process does struggle with or has issues with is uh, drilling through gravels um, and cobbles. Um, because obviously our process relies on that the, the drilling fluid that we make, which is the, which is the bentonite, um, it's basically creating a filter cake it's lining the bore that we are drilling with and, and it's stabilizing the bore. And this works extremely well in sands, in clays, in rocks, um, but obviously with an unstable formation like a gravel formation, you do have difficulty maintaining an open bore. So we are able to, to cope with this and there are two ways that we can do it. Um, one method is by using um, a polymer known as biogrout. Um, this is where you physically inject the ground um, with this uh, biogrout over a distance of, of and down to a depth of where you know the unstable ground is. Uh, you inject it into the uh, unstable formation. You then leave it for uh, a certain period of time, num num normally. Uh, a number of weeks. Um, and then during that time, the bacteria that uh, the biogrout has got in it, it creates a, a more stable and it cements the, the, 
rocks, cobbles or rocks or, or, or basically the, the gravels, as you can see on the, the top picture on the right, that it holds it all in situ and, and makes it then drillable. Um, another method is, is what you can see on the second picture there um, with the grouting machine. Uh, we have uh, successfully on a couple of occasions where we've, we've known that there are uh, particular gravel layers that we had no option, but we had to cross it, that basically this is where we've injected into the formation to stabilize it and then left it a week, a couple of weeks, and then that gives us the opportunity then of drilling through it. So that's, um, that's another option should you fail, feel that we've got grouts and, and there is no solution, but there can be, there can be a solution. Um, uh, this is more um, before the um, intersect drillings were, were, were more popular. Obviously, this was on a location where we had to, to cross a large waterway. Uh, we had two drillings, each in excess of uh, 1,300 meters. Um, and we did this by means of a, a cofferdam um, in the center of the river. We drilled one way 1,350 meters, rotated the drilling rig, and then went the other way. Um, so this is sort of, uh, and realistically now, providing the cables can take those uh, lengths for installation, because this is another thing that, although we may be able to install a duct or a pipeline, um, particularly when there's cable installations that have to go in there, it's whether you can physically pull these cables over these given distances without stretching them or damaging them. Um, I've put this, um, this slide, these couple of slides in because uh, as this is the Pipeline Industries Guild, this may be uh, of some interest or maybe people have heard of it or haven't heard of it. Um, so Pipe Express, this is a, uh, a method of installation that we have developed um, with one of the drilling rig uh, manufacturers. Um, and what it is, is it's if you need to install a cross country pipeline and you don't physically have the, the easement requirements where you are able to separate your topsoil subsoils, this is a sort of semi trenchless um, burial method where you can install pipelines um, at a given depth and basically you, you uh, install it as you go, sort of on the fly. Um, so this gives you an example here. So if you've got 100%, you only need sort of 30% of the easement um, for the installation. Um, I'll just show you this. So um, what it is, it, it's a combination of a, um, like a, a micro tunneling head with a pipe thruster. So what you have is an excavator, which is driving along, which is steering the head. Um, and as you can see the trencher here, this is actually excavating, putting the, um, the excavation excavated material to one side, and then you are directly installing the duct. Um, so again, this is something which um, may be of interest to, to you guys in the future, and we can always assist you if that, um, if that's the requirement. Um, so onto the landfalls and outfalls um, projects. Obviously um, a typical landfall outfall, which is what we, we do specialize in. Um, when you're designing something like this, uh, there's a number of design considerations. Um, one will be is uh, erosion, because we are particularly aware on the the east coast of the UK, some of the erosion levels are considerable. So obviously the, the HDD does need to be spaced back uh, uh, significantly to uh, ensure that uh, the life cycle of it, it's far enough back that you won't have corrosion, uh, sorry, erosion, and then it, it goes back to where the, the drill is. So that's one thing to consider. Um, and the other thing is, when you've got these uh, extended drillings, um, it's very important to make sure you are in the correct strata for, for drilling purposes. 
that you try and keep to one, one layer or one type of soil, then that also helps you uh, when you're building up your, your drilling tool design and you're, you're keeping to a constant. Um, so what I've got is I've got a few slides here uh, giving you uh, a, a typical of an, a nowadays uh, installation drawing um, for a HDD landfall. So initially uh, the pilot bore, what you have is you have your, your drill bit. If the soils are relatively stiff, you would require a drill motor. A bore motor or a drill motor is basically a rotor and a stator. So as you pump your drilling fluid down through the drill pipes, it is constantly rotating the bit on the end. Uh, you can see here just behind the bit, there is a bent housing, normally between one and three degrees. So as you're drilling, um, you've got your steering tool in the silver section here. So as you're drilling, uh, you're doing a combination of rotating the whole string, including the bend, and then every one or two meters, you're checking your position, uh, seeing what your inclination is and your azimuth or your compass direction, seeing where you are in relation to the theoretical, and then you're making slight corrections and then either sliding for a couple of meters where purely you're pushing the bend um, in a fixed position and then that pushes it in the required direction. So here, first thing is you drill your pilot bore. Um, normally, nowadays we are drilling them um, to approximately 90% of the uh, bore length. So what you're able to do is maintain the drilling circulation, the fluids coming right the way back to the drilling rig. Um, so then you're not discharging anything into the sea. You've got a closed circuit. So everything is returning back to the onshore rig location. You're cleaning the drilling fluids and then recirculating them. Once you've completed that operation, um, again, we have developed things over recent years that we predominantly now go forward reaming. Um, you have to be careful when you're forward reaming because it's not a, a natural um, design uh, for the drill pipes. Normally the drill pipes uh, are planned to be in tension, um, but we have done extensive calculations and we can now predict what is uh, an acceptable level for when we're forward reaming. So again, similar to the pilot operation, we are starting from the onshore position and we are with a bull nose. You can see the bull nose here. That is sized just a little bit smaller than the pilot hole. So in theory, that will follow then the pilot bore. And then we rotate and push forward the hole opener or fly cutter, dependent upon the, uh, the, the soils encountered. And again, there's the other type of cutter. This is for a typical cutter for sands and clays, and this is more for, for rocks or very stiff uh, clays. So we then advance that further forward, right the way to the exit point. Once you've actually got the, uh, the assembly on the, the seabed, that is then withdrawn back to the onshore point. And then we put in what we call the, the pullback assembly. What we have been my, mean by pullback assembly, the barrel reamer is slightly oversized from the pipeline you're installing, um, although, it, and it is smaller than the bore you've made with your uh, reaming assembly. That is then pushed right the way through to the exit point. Um, by this time, we have a marine support a vessel that has probably pre-dredged a um, exit pit and prepared it. Um, also, again, dependent on the, the circumstances, uh, the pipeline uh, will probably be manufactured or it will have been manufactured either in one continuous length in Norway and floated down, or it will have been manufactured on land and then floated out. Once we get the assembly through the bore, it's then a matter of, of bringing it round side of the barge, 
connecting it to our swivel and then basically pulling it back through the ball. So that's, that's the, the uh, installation process for um, a landfall. Um, nowadays, it can be possible to, to push the uh, pipes in, but again, it really depends on the pipeline specification. Um, do you have the facility to actually string the pipes out in one continuous length? Um, so this, these are some other uh, data sheets on, on other projects that we've completed. Uh, we've completed a, a number of uh, projects for offshore wind farms at the minute. They are, uh, they are quite prevalent at the moment. Um, and this was two drillings that we did uh, where we installed uh, in each bore a 450 millimeter PE duct over an 1125 uh, meter distance. Um, again, this was the, the Mongstad one, which we've seen. Um, and that's, that, that's all the slides I've got really, but um, I just really want to say that uh, the HDD process has come on a long way. And I think there are, uh, it could be used probably more often than it is in some cases. Um, we can engineer solutions and bespoke solutions um, for, for requirements when you may think it, it's not a viable option for HDD, uh, but it can be. One slide which um, I've, I've not put on there is, um, we've also done something with ductile iron. Um, you can appreciate with HDD that nor under normal circumstances, your drilling length, you normally fabricate the pipeline that's going to be installed in one continuous length beyond the exit point. So you really always need this, this stringing area. Um, now, one thing we did do a few years ago was uh, we did something with ductile iron. So we had a socket and a spigot and actually a connecting ring. Um, and that did work pretty well. So that would then give you the option if you needed to install a pipeline, uh, but you didn't necessarily have the stringing area to string the duct out. That is another option where you can actually have a very limited um, exit location and actually connect the ducts and pull them in as you go, so to speak. So um, yeah, that's another option, which I thought you guys might find of interest. Um, and that's really what I have for you guys. So um, thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, uh, we've had quite a few questions raised through the chat. Uh, yes. And again, if anybody has got some, please, can you all stay on mute and just type them in the chat? So I'll I'll run through them. And uh, if you can sort of give a, a fairly yeah. brief, brief yeah. response to them, because uh, yeah. a time uh, as obviously we've still got a time limit. So what are the British standards and Euro standards that you use? Um, it, it's the it's the EN. Uh, I think it's three four seven zero. Um, I, I can I can double check it, um, and and it's to do with the pulling forces, um, and also the uh, for the um, sorry it's for the pulling forces, and also for calculating the um, allowable pressures. Yeah, I, I can double check that. Yeah. Okay. How do you make the connections at the intersect drilling? Um, so what, what happens is when, you, when you're doing an intersect drilling, um, what you, you do is you pick a section of the bore which is very, uh, very flat or straight, and then slowly you, you drill from one side with your small pilot, you would then forward ream to make that slight bore slightly oversized. And then from the other side, you would slowly uh, reduce your inclination, uh, come in on above it, and then slowly drop into that bore. Because the critical thing is when you're doing an intersect, you don't want any sudden changes in direction. So it's very important to go steadily into the other bore so you don't have any dog legs at that point, which could ultimately cause you an issue when you're um, pulling in the duct or pipe. Is casing pipe mandatory or required? Um, not necessarily. Um, it's it's 
specific on the actual project. Um, sometimes it is an advantage to have a casing pipe. Um, a casing pipe, if, if anyone's unsure, it, it's, it's a sleeve which is going um, into the bore initially. And what you may find is that if you are going in and out of the bore uh, due to numerous reaming phases, it may be advantageous to have a casing in there um, because then at least you know that that section of the bore is stable and will not change. Whereas sometimes you find if you don't have a casing that slowly your angle is, is, is um, uh, increasing in front of the rig, which can give you some alignment problems. But sometimes it is beneficial for the casing and also because um, obviously when you start your HDD, uh, you have very little cover. And if you have it pre-installed the casing, it maintains a stable borehole until you're a little deeper where the fluid will naturally then flow back through the casing to your rig side entry pit. Okay, uh, what is forward reaming? Uh, forward reaming is forward reaming is uh, it is when you're enlarging the bore with a conventional HDD. Uh, if you're doing, for example, a river crossing, you would normally drill under the river, come out on the other side, and under normal circumstances, you would put on your cutter or your enlarging cutter because you need to make your bore bigger. Uh, to get the pipe in, you would put it on the opposite side and then the drilling rig would rotate and pull the, the reamer cutter back towards the drilling rig. So all the pipes are in uh, tension and it goes from the exit point back to the rig side. Forward reaming is when we actually do the hole enlarging from the rig side and going forward. And it, it, it's more on the landfalls and outfalls where we do the forward reaming. Under normal projects, you have the facility to, to transfer the drilling fluid from the exit side back to the rig side. During arc drilling, how is the welding of pipe strings achieved whilst at height? Um, it, 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 it's not. So what will happen is we will have 60 metres uh, and it will probably stick out um, 25 meters high. We will pull in one third of the drill string. So when that, the back of the, the string gets very level close to the ground, then we bring up and we, we hang the other second string, but the actual weld and coating and uh, testing is all done at, at normal working height, a meter, meter and a half off the floor. What is your approach towards carbon reduction? Um, carbon reduction, um, at the moment, um, we are looking at, um, uh, with regards to drilling rigs, uh, we are looking at different drilling rig options. Um, there are uh, electric drilling rigs that you can get, um, and also you can look at um, hybrid drilling rigs. Um, then you have the possibility, particularly with the electric or with the hybrid, and we do have a, a fully electric power pack. Um, so you can actually, as the legislation changes, at least it's a matter of just upgrading the generator. But yes, we are aware of that. And we, uh, we have also developed within the group um, something called no-nox. Um, which is basically uh, taking away uh, the, 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 the fumes and the, the, the uh, monoxides and, and actually cleaning them. And we have developed something for that. OK, I'm trying to work through them. There's questions popping up all the time. Arc drilling, is the pipe cold bent to the desired radius on site? And what effect does pulling curved pipe through straight sections of bore have on pulling forces? Right, so um, basically it is cold bent, so, so it is preformed, but it will be preformed. When you do arc drilling, you start off with a radius and you go straight the way to the other side with the radius because otherwise it doesn't work. So the, the whole bore is one continuous radius and then we slide sections 
with the same bending radius of what we've drilled. Um, so yes, it is cold bent uh, prior to pulling in, but there are no straight sections within the bore. It is a, the drilling is also an absolute arc. Okay, there's a comment saying, really interested in the arc drilling and the radius of pipe at 250 mil. Interested in comparative cost to normal HD and what would be the maximum external diameter of the rig that the rig could cope with? So I think um, how does it compare cost wise and what's the maximum size you can do? Um, well, I, I would say we've uh, those examples that I showed, they were 48 inch pipes. Um, we have worked on some of the larger uh, trans-European pipelines, which have, have come over from, from Russia, which are now 56 inch. Um, so I, I would say at the minute, probably 56 inch would be um, the, the biggest that you'd probably want to do or, or could be done. Um, what was the other bit of the question? Cost. Is it is it comparable cost or more expensive than um, normal HDD? Um, it, it's a comparable cost. And, and to be honest, it, it's relatively, uh, well, relatively speaking, cheap, uh, cheap because the drilling length, from a drilling perspective, it's just a, um, it's a shortish drilling. It's a drilling of maybe 180 meters. Although when you want to go to the bigger size, obviously you still need the bigger rig um, because you need to make quite a big bore if you're looking to install a 48 or a 56 inch pipeline. But comparatively, drilling-wise, the only extra you need is um, is the cranage and um, and the additional welders. And the pullback takes a little bit longer because you have to do two additional welds. What impact can groundwater flows have on drill fluids? Particularly, how can drill fluids be managed to prevent communication with groundwater in environmentally sensitive areas? Um, yes, we. But what we can do is um, normally, and, and we have this quite often in Holland, um, we have to drill through aquifers. Um, and normally what we can do is um, we do have a, the possibility um, of, of altering the, the solution that we can actually uh, stem the flow and, and build up this filter cake that we can actually pass through them. Um, but again, it's more down to the design um, but, but there are things we can do to to go through aquifers or, or groundwater to, to stem the flows. OK, I'm going to combine the next two because they're related. What methods are used when pipe coating needs protection? And also, what about cathodic protection for metallic pipelines? Um, yes, uh, what we find is that um, sometimes if there is a cross country steel pipeline, um, and has a, 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 a so many uh, a given coating, what no normally is the case, and it depends on what, what the ground conditions are. Um, maybe the, the HDD section would require an additional coating layer um, and, and also, okay, cathodic protection. Um, we're used to doing tests, obviously after installation, checking the coating. Um, and it's not something we've had a, a major issue with. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that you've got the correct coating on it before it goes in and, and knowing what you've got. Why has direct, uh, well, has ductile, ductile iron DD not been used more extensively in the UK as it has in Europe? Ductile iron. I, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, whether, uh, and, and this is why I, I thought I'd tell you guys about it, because obviously you're the pipeline guys. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm unsure um, because that, that, that's uh, the project I've mentioned. And I, if somebody wants any data sheets, I can give them uh, some data sheets on it, what we did. Um, yes, it worked pretty well. We made a frame uh, for the exit side. We then coupled two pipes together and, and we strung them, basically pulled in two joints, clicked them together and off they went for another two pipes. But it, it certainly gives you a, a possibility, particularly on, on pumped mains, 
um, where you've got limited area on the, the exit side from the drilling rig. OK, next question is, how do you treat the setup at SACs for appropriate assessment? SACs, what's? Uh, that's that's environmental. OK, uh, so I think it's it's what treatments do you do? Um, well, uh, for, from my perspective, I know that um, obviously on the landfalls uh, and outfalls, uh, we are um, we are looking or, or working in regards to uh, uh, materials which are plona registered um, or on a CFAS list. So um, all of our uh, we make sure that all of our products, our drilling products specifically, um, are uh, uh, basically approved for for the area that we're using them in. Um, so that's that's all I can say on that really. Um, so basically our products are whatever list or whatever um, the requirements are environmentally, um, we, we can um, abide by those. What are the advantages, disadvantages of pulling versus pushing pipe into the bore? Um, the advantages, uh, if you can uh, push a pipe into the bore, um, realistically, um, if it's uh, achievable, then uh, you're probably, if, if you're looking at a, a marine, I'm, I'm assuming we're just looking at marine uh, options. Um, so I would say by pushing it in, you, you are uh, looking to limit basically the uh, offshore spread that you have um, and further reducing your costs. Is casing not used in unstable materials, so no need for biograuting? Yes, casing uh, can be installed. There's uh, a number of methods that you can use. You can install a casing also to keep the bore. If, if you've got a very small or thin layer of, of unstable material, casing can be used for that. Um, the other option is that we've done in the past is basically just excavated down and um, and redrilled. Uh, uh, sorry, excavated the the gravel layer away and refilled with, with sand compacted material. So yes, it, it can be, the casing can have be installed for a, a number of reasons or different functions. Okay, I think we've got two questions left. So we're just about, we've got about a minute and a half, two minutes. So uh, what measures have you adopted for pre uh, preventing bentonite breakout in the drilling strata, particularly in environmental desensitive areas? Right, so um, another, um, development within the uh, the steering systems and, and tooling that we're using now, um, we are able to get downhole mud pressures. So previously, um, uh, before you're able to do this, we were doing calculations and comparing what the allowable mud pressure would be downhole and then adding it onto what we're normally looking at uphole. The advantage now of having the the downhole uh, mud uh, measuring sensoring of the downhole pressure, you may see the thing is you're, there's more chance you're going to catch it early. For example, if you um, if you see on that pressure reading downhole where the drilling head is, if you see that starting to climb, this may be at a point when you have full flow coming back to the rig side. So it, it's like a real early warning indicator that although you, you physically have fluid coming out of the bore, if you see that downhole pressure increasing, it's a bit of a, an, an early warning sign. And then you may decide to trip out the drill pipes, flush the bore, clean the bore out. So, so that is, is a, uh, an advantage that has been going, that is, is helping us to detect um, and reduce the risk of of uh, mud outbreaks. OK, and last question, which was what are the most significant geotechnical risks and any comments on typical ground investigation techniques required? Um, yes, uh, so the risks, uh, the geotechnical risks are um, basically the, the gravels or, or the unstable formations that we have to go through. 
Um, with regards to uh, sampling, um, I've got a complete list if somebody wants it that what we normally look for with, for a HDD, um, which then enables us to evaluate it and see um, uh, and, and see what is requirement and what uh, testing is is required. Yeah. OK, so it's one o'clock and I know uh, we, we're on the time limit. So thank you very much, Scott. I think from all the comments that we see in the chat, uh, your presentation has been very well received and there's some very interesting and challenging questions there. Yeah. Um, so on behalf of the Guild, thank you very much for giving the presentation. Um, and again, thank you for everybody for signing up and attending um, the presentation has been recorded and it will appear on the Guild's YouTube channel usually within a couple of days or certainly within a week of this presentation so you'll be able to see it there and catch up and and share it and I think hopefully we've managed to address most of the questions that were raised okay. so okay. thank you very much to everybody and please keep your eye on the uh, the Guild website for any upcoming webinars uh, on the events page. Uh, so thank you very much. Okay. Have a nice. Have a All good right, day. Thank you. Okay. See you, Martin. Bye bye. Bye.